that you would meet with us among your people this morning. We know that we cannot manufacture yes. anything. We can't work it up. But Lord, if you'll meet with us in this place, yes. it's good to be in God's house among Thank God's people Jesus. and to feel God's spirit flowing in this yes, place. Lord. Lord, we ask this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, good morning. It's a wonderful day to be in the Lord's house. This is uh, normally Jennifer's job, and she does the announcements, but she is uh, this weekend in Tacoa, Georgia, and she is speaking at a women's retreat, and uh, they started on Friday, and they'll end today, and so we're thankful that the Lord's using her, and do pray for them as they come back today that they'll have a good and safe trip home. And I know that the Lord has used them to do great things. So remember them as they come home. I also want to make a couple of other uh, announcements, prayer requests. Um, Janet had to go to the emergency room this morning. Ricky took her. And so we want to pray for her that, uh, that she would get well over her sickness. And then, um, I don't see Randall, but I think Randall's stepdad had a heart attack this week. Isn't that right? And so we want to pray for him too. Randy Morgan, write his name down and remember him in your prayers. So we want to pray for him uh, as the, he's dealing with that this week. Got a couple of announcements that I want to make uh, to you. Next Sunday morning is the women's breakfast. That'll be at 9 a.m. in the Life Center. And this will take place in lieu of our life groups. And so this is for ages high school and up. So the men will be cooking. And if you're a man and you would like to help cook, we need help. And so if you want to help cook, you can see David and let him know about that. Also, all the men will be covering all the life groups. So if you teach a life group, you won't have to do that next Sunday. Uh, that's specifically for the kids. Uh, you will not have to do that. The nursery will be open at 9 a.m. And so you can come, bring your kids, drop them off at 9. And I feel sorry for whoever's got to keep the nursery from 9 until 1045. But somebody's going to do it, I guess. All I know is it's not me. So remember that next Sunday morning, our women's breakfast at 9 a.m. Deborah Helms will be speaking. I love Deborah. I've known her for a lot of years. And I know that she'll be a blessing to you. She's a wonderful speaker. And so that is next Sunday morning, October the 20th. Be here at what time? 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Uh, what's that? Sign up in the foyer. You didn't write that on here. That's your fault, not mine. I'm just kidding. So there's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer, and if you plan to be here, sign up out there in the foyer for that. So that's out there, so remember that. On October the 26th, that's a Saturday, from 5 until 8 p.m., we're going to have our what we do every year, our fall festival, community fall festival, and uh, we need a lot of help. And um, if you'll go out this door, and maybe next Sunday we'll move it up here for any of you that don't like to go downstairs. If you go out this door, down the stairs, and right there at the bottom of the stairs, there's all kind of sign-up sheets that are laid out on that table to let you know what we need as far as volunteer or donations for prizes for different games, candy, little trinkets from the dollar store. On that table at the bottom of the stairs, all of that information can be found there, and there are sign-up sheets every, for everything of that. If you would, just before you leave today, if you're able, just, just pass by there this uh, morning and just maybe sign up if you'd like to help out for that. Uh, if you'd like to bring food, drinks, uh, if you'd like to help with games, there's a lot of different things that you can do. And so we'll have that down there today, and then maybe next Sunday morning we'll bring that up. One more thing I need to make an announcement for, and that is on Tuesday night, October the... Um, 21st, the Polk Harrelson Baptist Association will have their annual meeting. That's usually a two-night thing. This year, the first night is in Harrelson County. Polk and Harrelson Baptist Associations are together. So the first night's at First Baptist in Bremen. The second night is here at our church. It was not supposed to be at our church, but it was supposed to be at another church in town, but that pastor planned a revival on the night that he was supposed to hold the annual meeting. Not a smart pastor, is he? Sounds like something I would do. And uh, so instead of them hosting it, they asked if we would, uh, would host that. And so let's remember that is on Tuesday, October the 21st. Now here's what we need. We need a couple of men to help out in the parking lot to park people. Um, we need some folks that can help in the kitchen to serve uh, some the food to the people who come in and eat. There'll be a dinner at 5.30, I think, and then the service begins at 6.45. So we need people to help serve if you can. And then we just want people here with smiling faces and brushed teeth. Uh, both of those are important. And uh, washed hair, too, that are just here. Kind of, there's going to be a lot of people on our campus that uh, 
have never been here before and they may need to know where's the restroom, where's the changing room, where's the nursery at, all those different kind of things. And it would just help if we had some people here who uh, were able to just kind of guide people around. So as you leave today, there'll be a piece of paper on the, um, uh, on the table out in the foyer and they'll have different categories, parking, kitchen, greeting, and whatever you can help with, if you would just write your name down on there. Uh, I haven't told them this, but our music team will be providing some music too that night. And uh, so, uh, so they'll be doing that as well. It's going to be a great night. A lot of different churches will be here from all over our county and Harrelson County. Sometimes people wonder why we're a part of the association. Um, how many of you know this, that churches can do more together than they can apart? And so we're able to pool our resources together send missionaries all over the world through the International Mission Board, the North American Mission Board. Um, we're able to um, send missionaries around the state to start churches in other languages, to start churches in places where there are no churches. And then at its most basic level, we're able to come together as churches and strategize and come up with a vision to reach Polk and Harrelson County with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's exactly what Jesus said, right? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then unto the uttermost parts of the world. The Southern Baptist Convention has an arm called the ERLC, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. How many of you heard this week one of the candidates that is running on the Democratic ticket said in a town hall meeting, and when he said this, it blew my mind because everybody in the room screamed and cheered. He said, any church, any church who does not fully affirm same-sex marriage, if I'm president, they will have their tax-exempt status revoked and taken away. Somebody said that this week who is actively running for president of the United States. I hope you'll wipe the fog off of your eyes and realize what direction this thing is headed if you don't already know that. But the Southern Baptist Convention has an arm called the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. I don't agree with everything they put out, but one thing I do agree with that they're in Washington right now fighting for churches to have what we have been granted by the Constitution of the United States. So every month when you read the Treasury Report and you see the money that goes to the cooperative program, that money goes, just our little part goes to fund all those different things. And I don't know about you, but I want somebody besides the politicians advocating on my behalf in Washington. Do you agree with that? And so it's just a wonderful thing. And so that's what our annual meeting will be on Tuesday night, October the 21st. Uh, do remember that. I want to pray. Just saw Hunter over here. I want to, we want to keep praying for his dad. Uh, he's going through some different issues. He's been in the hospital. He got really well and then had a setback. And so we want to pray for Mike Putnell. Write his name down. And then I want to ask you to pray for me too. As you know, I'll be going in Tuesday for surgery. And I'll uh, be having my tonsils taken out. And then for three weeks, you'll be hearing some uh, preaching. And it's going to be great preaching. I'm excited about it. I hope I feel like coming next Sunday. But probably that won't be reasonable. But I expect to be back the week after that. Kenny will be preaching next Sunday. Uh, the Sunday after that, Brother Chris Kitchens will be preaching. Sunday after that, Brother Garrett will be preaching. On Sunday nights, uh, next Sunday night, we're going to be joined by Second Baptist Rock Mart. Their pastor, Brother David Warner, is going to be preaching. He's a, he's, man, he's a sharp guy. He's one of the smartest guys in our area. You'll really enjoy him. The following Sunday night, my Uncle Kenny, I'm so proud of him, the change that God's made in his life. He's going to be sharing with us on Sunday night, the 27th. And then on, on November the 4th, on Sunday night, we're going to be joined by Providence Baptist Church from Tallapoosa. And my friend, Brother Curtis Pixler, is going to be preaching. And Curtis is a man of God and a wonderful preacher of the Word. So we're going to have great preaching through the services. It's going to be wonderful, and I'm so excited about that. And so remember all those things as they're coming up. Uh, Brother Billy, if you would grab our globe over there. And at this time, we will take up our mission offering, raise those dollars up high, and we'll come around and receive them at this time. All right?
from the cross of Jesus Christ, of which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. How many of you agree with me this morning that our hope is only in the cross and nothing else? I can't work my way into being accepted by God. I'm accepted because of what Jesus Christ has done. We're going to stand this morning and sing an old song. Let's sing it out. Let's sing it like a new. I love this song. Think about the word. Thank you. 
Jesus is right.
able to do every one of those things and more. Amen. Amen. Sure. I love that line. There's a truth older than the ages. Amen. What a thought. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He's our Alpha and Omega, yes. our beginning yes. and our end. There is no name I access given among men whereby you must be saved right. except the name of Jesus. What a name that is. Yes. This one is. <laughs>
to be released to Children's Church. Amen. Well, thank the Lord for his great name. Amen. It is a wonderful name. There is no other name like Jesus. And we thank the Lord for that. Take your Bible this morning. Turn to the book of Galatians chapter number 6. Galatians and chapter number 6. And I want to begin reading in just a moment at verse number 11. Galatians chapter number 6 and verse number 11. I uh, have been in contact with several people and I feel like that God is lining us up with somebody to come in here and to uh, really take our music ministry to the next level and to allow me to take my pastoral ministry to the next level. And so uh, I I want you to pray for me that the Lord would give me discernment. Um, It is an awful thing to have to make decisions, isn't it? Um, I read something this week. It said, you know why women cannot uh, decide where they want to go eat or what they want to eat? Because the last time they did, they brought the curse of sin upon the entire human race. And uh, I thought, amen. That's true, isn't it? So uh, I'm, uh, I'm impervious to decision making. Really am. Because there's always a chance you could be wrong. And I have been wrong before. And I'm not going to stand up here and say, I know God's come out of heaven and spoke to me in an audible voice and said that this is the man. But I do feel confident. There's a lot of details have to be worked out. Whether or not we feel like we're ready for that as a church. Whether you feel like you're ready. A lot of different things that, um, that we need to work out. But I believe God's working in the details, and I believe He'll work those things out. And so I'm excited uh, to come back tonsil-free and hopefully music ministry-free <laughs> at the same time. Amen? And so that is my goal and my desire. And uh, I'm excited uh, about those prospects and, and that possibility. So I want to not jokingly, but seriously, ask you and invite you to pray with me. Would you do that? If you would do that, just say amen. And uh, pray that the Lord would just make His will clear and plain because I'm, I'm dumb. I know you think I'm smart, but I'm not nearly as smart as you think I am. I need the Lord to make it cl- plain for me. Anybody else identify with that? Say, Lord, don't make me fill out a Sudoku to try to fill, figure out your will. Just make it real plain. Write it, uh, write it in the sky and, and let me know. And that's what I, I really desire for Him Uh, to do. I was counting this morning in my office as I was looking through my Bible uh, the different books that I've preached through in my time uh, here as pastor at Young's Grove. And this is the 14th book study that I'm going to complete today as we finish up the book of Galatians. I have to be honest with you, it maybe has been one of my favorites um, because of the truth that is found in this passage of Scripture. Paul writes in Galatians in a way and in a tone that he never has previously written in and never will write in again afterwards. How many of you know this truth, especially those who have multiple children? You love them all the same, but there's just some that require more attention and more, shall we say, Patience and and long-suffering. My mama knows that to be true, 100%. And it wasn't me that required the patience and long-suffering. Amen, y'all know what I'm saying. So, So Paul has all of these spiritual children. He has the Ephesians, he has the Philippians, he has the church at Corinth, he has the believers at Rome, he has the believers at Thessalonica, he has all these believers, but none of them try his patience and push him to the very limits of his spirituality and sanctification like those believers at Galatia. 
Oftentimes, Paul begins his letter by saying, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always giving faith for your thanks for your faith and your work in the Lord and your labor of love for me and my ministry, and I pray for you at all times. All these different things, kind of an introductory hello, what, what many Bible scholars would call a salutation. In Galatians, in Galatians the Bible says, uh, Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ to the churches at Galatia, I marvel that you could be so dumb. No, hello, Paul. No, how you been? No, how's your mom and them? None of that. No, 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 no. Right into the meat of this thing. I marvel that you could so quickly and so soon walk away from the faith which I delivered to you. What I would like to do this morning is preach a sermon that I'm titling, A Bow on the Box. And what I'd like to do this morning in this last passage of Scripture, because I believe it's what Paul does as he writes this, I'd like to take this entire book study that we've done together on, sermon, on Sunday mornings, and I'd like to put a bow on the box. Came up with that all by myself. Tonight I'm going to circle back and I'm going to preach Galatians 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, which is an incontrovertible and undisputable law that Scripture teaches. Isaac Newton discovered some laws. He said, what goes up must come down. And the Bible teaches some laws, and here's one of them. That which a man sows, he will also reap. Can I, get, can I give a diagnosis for some of you this morning? You're planting worldly seeds and, and expecting spiritual fruit to come up. And you'll never plant an apple seed and get oranges. It will never happen. So I want to invite you to come back tonight. I'm going to be preaching on that idea from Galatians chapter number 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Let's begin reading in verse number 11. I, I love this passage of Scripture. It's one that I've preached many times, but I did some fresh study this week to try to bring it to my remembrance again. Paul says in verse number 11, See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. God forbid. If you're looking through the Bible for a life verse, you'll not find one better than Galatians 6.14. God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, there's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. That doesn't avail anything. But the gospel of Christ Jesus, can I just add an addendum there to make sure it's plain and clear, yields a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. And it's, from now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks. Some translations render, render that phrase, the brand marks. You know what the Greek word there is? It's a movie that some of you have probably seen. The Greek word that Paul uses there is stigmata. Anybody ever watch that movie? You're sick. Quit watching stuff like that. Amen? Mess with your head. For I bear in my body the stigmata, the brand marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for the privilege to preach this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you would help me to preach with clarity and conviction. God, help me to say only what I need to say and nothing else. Lord, I pray that you'd speak through me during this time. Give me unction and anointing and set my words on fire. I pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody in agreement said, Amen. I want to give you just some concluding purposes, reasons that you can pull from this passage of Scripture that I think will help you to explain why it is that Paul wrote this letter to the Galatian believers 
uh, in the first place. And Eric asked me, he said, you don't really have any points this morning? And I said, no, but I, I do want to give you four ideas, so to speak, that uh, will kind of help you understand and realize why it is that Paul wrote this letter to the church at Galatia. Number one, I think that you'll find from verse number 11 that Paul writes this letter to the church at Galatia to express concern. Number one, Paul writes this letter to the church at Galatia to express concern. Verse number 11 says something very interesting. It says, See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. Now, people, uh, Bible scholars have different ideas and different philosophies on what it is exactly that verse number 11 means. What is Paul saying when he tells this church at Galatia, see with what large letters I have written with my own hand? There's basically two views on that. Number one, some people identify Paul's thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 as a problem related to his eyes and concerning his vision. Now I have in my life heard preachers make all kind of different theories and explanations according to what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. You know what the Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians 12? Paul says it is carried up into the third heaven. Ron told us in, in our conference the difference in the first heaven, the second heaven, and the third heaven. First heaven is just the area above us in the sky. The second heaven is the celestial realm where all the planets and the stars and the galaxies reside, all of those things. The third heaven is a place where God resides. Where is heaven? What is heaven? Brother Ron said this, I completely agree with him. He said that heaven, we don't know exactly where it is, but this is one thing that I would say about heaven. Heaven is actually a mobile location. Heaven is not stationary. Because I would say to you that when the Bible speaks of heaven, it speaks of the, it is synonymous with our God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so heaven is wherever God is. And let me add something else. Hell is wherever God is not. And it's as simple as that. And so we see that Paul has this thorn in the flesh. Man, I've heard people try to say that Paul battled homosexuality. And, uh, and, and basically what they do is they use that to excuse sin. Can't do it. I've heard people say, well, Paul wasn't married. Maybe he struggled with that. Listen, don't read into Scripture what's not there by itself, okay? Let Scripture speak where Scripture is clear. Where Scripture doesn't speak, you don't speak either. Amen? It's very clear. Paul says to the Galatians in an earlier chapter, he says, I know that you all love me so much that you would give your eyes to me if you could. Hint, hint. Why would they want to give him his eyes? Oh, because his don't work. Paul has a vision problem. Maybe Paul wrote some large letters here in this letter because he couldn't see very well. And people who have trouble seeing write really big. Or secondly, I think you that this is actually what happened. I think Paul struggled with vision, but I don't think that's why he wrote large letters. What would happen in the New Testament time period, which was almost common for every letter that Paul wrote, except perhaps maybe the ones that he wrote in prison, but even probably those were characterized by this same process. Paul had somebody that was called an amanuensis. We might call them today paralegals. We might call them secretaries. We might call them uh, clerks. And Paul would verbally speak to this secretary what it was that he wanted to be written down. And at the end of the letter, Paul would write a few verses in his own handwriting. And basically what that did was it served as Paul's signature. Paul is telling the church that he's writing to, all right, everything in this letter might not have been, been penned by my hand, but it was spoken from my mouth, and it has the apostolic authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm going to write a couple of verses here at the end just to prove to you and remind you that this is me writing. Sometimes I'll write an email to people, though, however, and if it's something really important that I want them to see, it's something that I don't want them to miss. I'm, I'm saying this is the most important part of this email. If you don't get anything else I say in this email, make sure and read this. Here's what I'll do. I'll make it bold. I'll make it red, because it's hard to miss red. And then I'll make the font about 18, so it'll stick out from the rest of the email. I would say to you that the reason that Paul wrote with big letters is not so much because he had a vision problem, 
But because he was so concerned about what was going on in the church at Galatia, that he wrote with large letters to tell them, hey, you need to listen up and you need to catch what I'm saying because this is one of the most foundational and important elements of the entire Christian life. Listen to me. If you do not get the cross right, Paul says, then the rest of your faith will be built on sinking sand. When Jesus says the parable of the man who built his house on the rock and built his house on the sand, understand that that is a story about two different paths that a person can take when they choose to follow the the Lord Jesus Christ. Either you can build your house on Christ the solid rock and it'll stand for all of eternity, or you can build your house on sinking sand and though you're here today, you won't be here very long. So I might would preach this sermon a little louder than I normally would. I might would say, hey, don't miss this this morning. Because if you don't get this right, believer, in the 21st century, everything else about your faith will crumble. Paul wanted to express concern to them. I would say secondly to you this morning, Paul wrote to eliminate corruption. I would say Paul wrote to eliminate corruption. Look at what he says in verse number 12. And as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised to keep the, they, do they keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. So there's, there's obviously the element of persecution here that's being discussed in these verses. Now the question we have to ask ourselves is where is this persecution coming from? Really it could only be from two places. First, the persecution could be coming from the Roman government because we know that Christianity was not a state-sponsored religion. It was not a state-accepted religion. And on into the third century, people who would not bow the knee to Caesar but instead bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ were killed on the spot. There's a second place that this persecution could have come from, and I think if you study the Scriptures, it makes a whole lot more sense that this is the reality. How many of you remember the passage that we preached several Sunday nights ago from John chapter number 9? There was a blind man who, who Jesus encountered, and Jesus gave him his physical sight back. That's in John 9, 1, I think, up to verse 12. In between verse 12 and verse 35, where Jesus not only gives him his physical sight, but later on in John chapter 9, Jesus gives him his spiritual sight. Better to be physically blind and spiritually able to see than to be physically having 20-20, but spiritually walking in darkness. In between those two sections, there's a whole lot of verses. And one of the verses in that little interlude passage encounters this blind man's parents. And they say, when questioned about what happened to this blind man, you know, we don't really know what happened to him. We don't know who gave him his sight back. You know, we're like y'all. We've heard about this Jesus who is the Christ, and we don't know what's happened to him. We don't know how he can see. You know, he's an adult. Go ask him. And the Bible says the reason that they would not give a clear answer is because they, they were afraid that they'd be thrown out of the temple which tells you that during the New Testament time, people who believed in Jesus Christ were being thrown out of the temple. They were being cursed by the Pharisees. And so this is the point that you have to grasp about the book of Galatians. These Judaizers that Paul is writing to, they're wanting the best of both worlds. Yeah, we like the Jesus message. We like the fact that the cross was the place where redemption was secured and all of that business and He is the perfect spotless lamb and all that stuff. We like all that, but we also want to hold on to this stuff because, you know, we just not end all that persecution. I mean, we love Jesus, but, but we don't love Him enough to like, uh, you know, get beat for it. I mean, we're all in on the Jesus thing, but now when it starts costing us something personally, then we're going to have to alter and doctor this message a little bit so that it becomes more palatable and acceptable to those who are in authority and in power. 
My wife and I were sitting on the couch last night and we were discussing, do, you think, do, do we think that Christians in America experience true persecution? Now, you can disagree with me. and Well, you've got the right to be wrong. Amen? Both of us have the same answer. Absolutely not. We have no concept of persecution. Well, bless our heart if they take our tax-exempt status. Good luck finding our offerings. I'm going to go bury it in the cemetery after Sunday morning. Amen. Hey, y'all don't know, son. We hid moonshine from the government for 100 years. We'll hide our church offerings just as well. Amen. No, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. Yeah, I got you off subject, didn't you? Just imagine if you were me up here trying to remember what you were talking about again. No, I'm just kidding. We have no concept in the American church of what real, true persecution is. But I want to tell you something. If you're under the age of 50 in here, I believe you're going to get a little taste of it before you die. I think, you're, I think we're going to get a little taste, a small taste. I don't believe we'll get the full thing like they did in the first century, but I believe we're going to get a little taste of what it was like for them in the first century. And that's where the rubber really meets the road, Brother Billy. That's where you really find out who's in and who's out. I took a class in seminary on, the church hist- on church history, and we studied the ancient period there right after the age of the apostles. And we, we, we discussed in one chapter, I remember talking about the renouncers, and they were those people who, when pressed by the Roman government to bow the knee to Caesar or die, they bowed the knee to Caesar. But when they were let go, guess what they did the next Sunday? They wanted to come back to church. And when the people who had lost mama, daddy, brother, sister, because they wouldn't bow the knee, turned around and seen that one who saved their own hide, who would bow the knee just so they could live, boy, they had some big problems with that. For about 100 years, they argued and disputed over what are we to do with the renouncers? What are we supposed to do with these people who have bowed the knee to Caesar and want to come back into our fellowship? Could it be that in our lives we experience some of the same things here in America? I'll tell you what, that's when we'll really figure out who's in and who's out. Paul wanted to eliminate corruption. He wanted to teach them that the gospel is about Jesus plus nothing, and your flesh has nothing to do with it. Thirdly, I believe Paul wrote to the Galatian church because he wanted to explain the cross. I believe Paul wrote to the Galatian church because he wanted to explain the cross. Verse number 14, God forbid that I should boast, God forbid that I should glory, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Just a couple of weeks ago, I talked to you about the three crucifixions that are mentioned in the New Testament, the primary crucifixions. We mentioned those that... We're crucified with Christ. Christ was crucified on the cross. But then thirdly, that we are crucified according to Galatians chapter number 6 verse 14 to the world. Let me just spend a few moments here explain something to you that I believe is what the Galatians mixed up. And I would say to you, secondly, that it's not only what the Galatians mixed up, but it's also what many believers are mixing up in the church today. The best place to explain this is in Colossians chapter number 3, verses 2 through 5. Colossians chapter number 3, verses 2. I want, I want you to turn there with me, actually, because I want you to mark a few words if you're one of those people who likes to mark in your Bible. I believe this will be real helpful for you. Colossians chapter number 3, verses 2 through 5. He'll have it up behind us, but if you would, turn there too, and I want you to notice some things. We all know verse number 2, don't we? Famous Christian verse. Set your mind on things below... And you'll be beset by depression, heartache, grief, despair. You never have joy. You never have peace. You never have contentment. All those fruits of the Spirit that we mentioned at the end of chapter 5. If you set your mind on things below, you will never have those things. 
That's not a Bible verse. I'm just telling you the opposite of what verse 2 says. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. Listen to verse 3. For you died. Underline that phrase. For you died. Past tense. And your life is hidden with God, in, or hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Therefore, put to death, underline that phrase, present tense, your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is, a, is coming upon the sons of disobedience. There's two deaths that Paul speaks of in that passage of Scripture. Verse number two, verse number three, excuse me, he says, For you died. It's in the past tense, and it's a passive phrase. That means that you died. It was something that happened in the past. It was something that God did, and it's something that has continuing results. You died. The reality of your position is that you are dead. Now, let me tell you what the Galatians confused and what we confuse as believers. We confuse the difference between two theological ideas. Standing and state. We confuse the difference between standing and and state. Now what's the difference? Your standing is who you are in Jesus Christ. It is your position. Paul told the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things what? And all things become new. And nothing can change that. If you have received that standing, if you have been brought from death unto life, nothing can change your standing because the reality of verse 3 is true. For you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. So here's what the Galatians didn't understand. Here's what they totally missed about their faith. Here's what they could not wrap their minds around. Their standing was not tied up in anything they could do, would do, or had done. Their new position in Jesus Christ was wholly tied up in the finished work of the cross of Calvary. The reason you cannot lose your salvation is because you never could earn it in the first place. And you cannot lose what you never gained. You can't. And so your standing is totally and completely secure based on the promise of Hebrews 10. That Jesus Christ came as the Lamb of God and He offered one permanent, perfect sacrifice for all the sins of all who would believe and anybody who will believe their sins will be placed under the blood of Jesus Christ and they'll never be brought up again. And the Bible promises you something. The Bible promises you something in salvation. The the Bible promises you that those sins that are covered by the blood of Christ, God will remember them no more. God doesn't have bad memory. God only forgets what He desires to forget. And in His mercy, He has forgotten those sins which are under the blood of Jesus Christ. And what's He say in verse number 5? Excuse me, verse number 6. Because of these things, what things? Those sins that are uncovered. Those sins and the sons of disobedience, those who are lost. Because of those sins which are uncovered, the wrath of God is coming upon them. Because their standing is not secure. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift gift of God. But then the second thing... And this is where the Galatians blurred the lines. They blurred the lines between standing and state. Your standing is who you are in Christ. I'm saved. I'm a child of God. I'm accepted in the beloved. Nothing can change that. Because I'm accepted based on Jesus. So if I'm accepted based on Jesus, as long as He never changes, my standing will never change. And how many of you know He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, according to Hebrews 13, 7? 
So he cannot change. So my standing cannot change. Riddle me this, preacher. Why do I feel lost sometimes? Why do I lose my assurance? See why we've messed salvation up so much. And people say, well, preacher, is it really that big a deal? Let me tell you something. When it comes to theological things, words matter. Words matter. And we've taught people things like, accept Jesus into your heart. And we emphasize hell. Oh, don't go to hell. Go to heaven instead. What well, if I told you this? I almost put this on Facebook last night, but I didn't feel like arguing with people who disagreed. What if I told you that the goal wasn't heaven, but the goal was holiness? What if I told you that the goal wasn't that one day we would be at the great marriage supper of the Lamb, but that one day we would present ourselves before the Lord complete, sanctified, and finally glorified in the Lord Jesus Christ. What if I told you that the goal was not heaven, but the ultimate goal was holiness? You know the theme song for the, the Jewish people in the Old Testament? It was not one day we'll get to the promised land. It was this right here. The Lord says, be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. But we sell a false bill of goods, and so people believe in a non-biblical salvation, and then we never see any fruit, and we wonder why nobody sticks, nobody remains, because they're no more saved than the person who's never darkened the doors of the church. The reason why you spend portions of your life feeling unsaved is because your standing has not changed. You are who you are in Christ Jesus because it never was based on your performance anyway. Can I say something to you this morning? Your performance matters. Your performance matters. And if you don't believe that, you need, to go, you need to go listen to the sermon on the website this afternoon that Brother Ron preached on Sunday night concerning the judgment seat of Christ. If you believe your performance for the Lord Jesus Christ does not matter, you need to go listen to that sermon this afternoon. I'm not telling you your performance will keep you saved. But I tell you what, it'll give you a good idea that you are saved. Abraham said, can a man who has a faith that never produces any works in him really claim to be saved? He said, can that kind of faith save a man? It was a rhetorical question to which he had already answered. The answer is no. But here's what happens. Your state changes in your Christian life. And this is why the writer of Colossians says in verse number 5, Therefore, put to death your members... So you're already dead in Christ. That is the legal justification of what Christ has done in your life. You are dead to yourself. When we baptize somebody, we take them down under the water to illustrate that the old man is dead. And we raise... The, this is why you got to dunk. You can't sprinkle. Y'all identifying with that right there? This is why you have to dunk. Because you are put down in the water and it's illustrative of the fact that the old man is dead and then we bring you up to show that you have been raised in new life in Christ. That is your standing, you are in Christ and you walk away from there and the old man is justificationally dead. But every single morning, every Sunday morning, nope. Sunday morning, Sunday night, uh-uh. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, no. Nope. Every morning you must wake up and put to death your members or they will put you to death. Either you will crucify the world to yourself or the world will nail you to the wall and have you doing things that you never thought you'd do again. Bill Stafford, who just went home to be with the Lord, said, give me 30 minutes apart from the Holy Spirit and there's no telling what I would do. You'd say, boy, that sounds awful. It's true for every single one of us. Our state. Paul tells the church at Colossae, wake up every morning and put to death the members of your flesh. Because they're earthly. And you know why so many days you don't feel saved? 
because you're dwelling in the flesh, you're not putting to death the members of the flesh. And let me ask you something. If you're going to soak yourself in the things of this world, what in the world makes you think you're going to feel godly at all? If you're going to be so consumed with the things of this world, let me tell you something. I, I, I'm, I'm preaching an L.A. tap message this morning. One pointing out, three pointing back. Blake, if you're going to be so consumed with the things of this world, Matt, what makes you think you're going to feel holy, feel saved? And so here's the extreme nature that the Galatians took it to. They said, all oh, your standing is not only in Jesus, but your standing is in keeping the law. Your standing is in keeping the feast days. Your standing is in making sure that you remain holy, that you don't eat things that you ought not eat, that you don't associate with people that you ought not associate with. Paul said, no, 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 no. You're confusing those things. Your standing is in the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he did at Calvary, and it cannot change. But your state, there's some requirements for you. And this is what we don't tell people anymore. Oh, just come get saved, pray a prayer, get up, walk away, and don't go to hell. Oh, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, your life is no longer your own. It is now his. For His glory and His honor. You, let me say it this way. You can't just do what you want to anymore. you got to start doing what He desires of you. Most people, perhaps, perhaps, let me say it this way. Perhaps many of them have a genuine conversion experience, but there's never any growth. There's certainly room in the book of Hebrews for people who get saved and don't grow. I'm not saying that everybody who has this experience doesn't experience a genuine conversion. Because Paul says, or excuse me, not Paul, I don't know who wrote Hebrews. Whoever wrote Hebrews says, let us leave the elementary things of the faith. So there's obviously some people that should have been in high school, but they were still in preschool. Amen? And there's some folks in this room this morning who by now ought to be teachers. But you're still having to be taught. Why is that? Somebody the other day said, in one of our associational meetings, they said, you know, it just seems like there's no pastors anymore. Nobody's being raised up to fill these churches in Polk and Harrelson County that are without pastors. And I thought to myself, and I think I maybe even said it out loud, I said, and, and, and we have to beg to ask the question, is God asleep at the wheel? I mean, has he, ha has he quit calling men? I mean, is God up there in heaven not realizing that there, there are flocks of sheep without a shepherd and God's just not calling any more shepherds into the ministry? Or is it that God's people are not listening, not heeding, not answering the call that God has on their life because they've bought into the false notion that, well, I'm not going to hell and that's good enough for me. But what about that daily process that Paul speaks of to the Galatians? What say you about that? What about the doctrine of repentance? Oh my goodness, I've been reading a book this week that I just bought. It's by Thomas Watson. He's a Puritan preacher. Long been dead. Died in the 16th, 17th century. Wrote a book called The Doctrine of Repentance. What is repentance? Well, it's to say I'm sorry. No, 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 no. It's so much more than that. I would, I would say to you tonight, that this morning, that saying sorry is confession. Repentance is changing the mind, changing the way you think, turning from the sin that, according to Hebrews 12, does so easily beset you. Why don't I feel saved, preacher? Because you're beset by all the things of this world. What do I need to do? You need to do what Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, put to death the things of the flesh. It's the dual reality of the cross. Jesus Christ died at the cross to change my standing. Jesus Christ died at the cross, John 19, 30, to tell us that it is finished, and it was. Jesus was not finished. His work was not finished. He was not done. He was not through. The enemy had not defeated him. He was not rendered impotent or invalidated. But when Jesus says it is finished, what he's saying is that the work which I came to do is now done. It is completed. It is thoroughly finished. Nothing else is needed. But here's the reality of it. Jesus was not the only one who died that day. There were two thieves on each side who died a physical death, but there was also every single believer in the Lord Jesus Christ who must climb up on that cross and die to their own selves. So that Christ may rule and reign in what Paul calls their mortal bodies. Brother Ron calls it the second aspect of the cross. 
We've mastered the first aspect, but rarely in my life have I found people who preach the second aspect. We want to get them out of hell. But we also need to make them fit for heaven. I was listening to a preacher this week, Major, Major Ian Thomas, British preacher who lived in Denver, Colorado. He said, what if I told you that Jesus did not just die to forgive you of your sins? He said, because if Jesus only died to forgive you of your sins, then that would make you totally equipped for heaven, but hopelessly unequipped for earth. Most people come to the altar and they pray and they receive Christ and nobody tells them what they're supposed to do between now and there. And the reason is because we don't know how to live. We don't, we don't understand that Jesus Christ died to get us into heaven, but He was resurrected and offered us His life so that we might succeed in the Christian life here on earth in the here and the now. Yanislav Polinsky said, If Christ was not raised, then none of this matters. And he said, If Christ was raised, then nothing else matters except Him. See, the truth is the same. If Christ was not raised, then there's no point. But if He was, then He's the only point. And so he says, Come... Die the death that I died at Calvary and be infused with the life that I displayed in the garden tomb on the very first resurrection Sunday morning. Paul wrote this letter to explain the cross. And then let me give you the third thing. Paul wrote this letter, fourth thing, excuse me, to end controversy. Paul wrote this letter to put an end to controversy. Here's what Paul said in verse number 17. He said, listen, let nobody trouble me anymore. Let nobody else trouble me anymore because I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what Paul was saying? I I like sassy Paul. Don't y'all? He says, you know those Judaizers? He says, go ask them how many lashes they've taken for Jesus. Go ask them how many times they've been in prison for Jesus. Go ask them how much money they've sacrificed for Jesus. Go examine their flesh and see if there's any wounds that'll back up the message that they proclaim. Paul said, I bear in my body The brand marks. Boy, if you're going to get whipped for something, you better believe in it strongly. You know what I believed in as a kid? My way. I was stubborn. Believed in my will. And so when my mama whooped me, I turned around and said, That don't hurt. Because I believed in my way. How many of you think I'm about to pay? Paul believed in this message. Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ because here's the truth. When one is persecuted on behalf of Christ, Christ is actually persecuted. When you persecute a believer, you you persecute the very Son of God Himself. Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatian believers, I love you, and I can prove it to you by what I've sacrificed for you. Ask what those Judaizers have sacrificed for you. Nothing. Nothing. Is there a greater blessing in the Christian life than to have people like the Apostle Paul who will pour into you, invest in you? I really came to this conclusion last week as I was studying for the sermon I preached last Sunday morning. Galatians is a book about discipleship. It really is. It's a book about discipleship. What a blessing it is to have Pauls in your life who will teach you and show you the faith and how to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As they come this morning, every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've never been saved. Your standing has never changed. You've never passed from death into life. You have never believed on the Lord Jesus for salvation. Jesus Christ came to this earth. He was born of a virgin, lived a perfect and sinless life, was crucified, died a real death, 
was laid in a borrowed tomb for three days. He sat there dead, but on the third day he arose victorious. He ascended into heaven at God the Father's right hand. He now ever lives to make intercession. He's the go-between between a holy God and a sinful man. You can be saved today if you'll believe on the Lord Jesus. Give your life totally over to Him. Maybe you're here this morning and you're saved, but you've not realized that second aspect of the cross. That it's not just a place where Jesus died, but it's a place where we must too die. I pray that that would become a reality for you this morning. I'm going to pray for us. If you need to do business with the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to invite you to come. I'll be here to pray with you, so will others. Whatever you need to do as we sing in just a moment. Father, we thank you for the privilege to be here in your house, to worship you, to hear the word preached, to hear songs sung. Lord, I pray that you would use us to proclaim the bold message of Jesus Christ plus nothing for salvation. Use this time of invitation to work in our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together this morning. Just as I am without one plea, but that